Hey everyone, welcome back to AshDev. In this video, we'll explore some incredibly useful math F functions that are often overlooked but can make a big difference in your projects. From mastering smooth interpolations with LERP functions to performing complex calculations with ease, we've got it all covered. Let's elevate your coding skills to the next level. First off, let's discuss the LERP function which interpolates a value from a starting value to an ending value based on a parameter t, which ranges from 0 to 1. When t is 0, lerp returns the starting value, and when t is 1, it returns the ending value. To understand this with an example, suppose the starting value is 0 and the ending value is 100. If t is 0.1, the function will return 10. If t is 0.5, it will return 50. To interpolate the value from 0 to 100, you essentially change t from 0 to 1, which you can achieve with a loop. However, in many tutorials, instead of using a loop to interpolate a value, people often set the starting value as the current value and use a rate of change as t. Using this approach, each frame the value moves from the current point towards the ending value, but this no longer interpolates linearly. As the value approaches the end point, the rate of change decreases which is often not mentioned. The value will never actually reach the endpoint using this method. As the value gets closer to the endpoint, the interpolation slows down more and more. So if you want automatic linear interpolation, you should use the move towards function. In this function, you need to provide the current value, the target value, and the speed of interpolation. And the value will interpolate linearly towards the target. If you are interpolating an angle, you should use the move towards angle function, which ensures the shortest distance interpolation, unlike the regular move towards function, which doesn't account for angular wraparound. The lerp function also has a variant called lerp angle, which interpolates angles and accounts for the shortest path around the circle. Next, if you want a smooth endpoint with the lerp function, but don't want to use it incorrectly, you can use the smooth step function. Smooth step works similarly to lerp by taking a start point, end point, and a value t ranging from 0 to 1 as parameters. However, unlike lerp, smooth step provides a slowed smooth ending. To get the desired value, you need to change t over time, just like with lerp, but with the added benefit of a gradual easing at the end. For smoother and damped motion at the start and the end point, you can use the smooth damp function. This function takes the starting point the target value, and a velocity variable for setting an initial velocity for the interpolation, but ideally set it to zero. And lastly, the time over which you want the interpolation to occur. Smooth damp automatically interpolates with a damped start and end, providing a smoother transition compared to lerp. Additionally, smooth damp has two more optional parameters. Maximum speed, which is set to infinity by default, meaning there is no speed limit and the time since the last frame, which is for advanced use and is set to time.delta time by default. There is also a smooth damp angle function variant, similar to move towards angle, which can be used for angle interpolation when smoother transitions are needed. There are two more lerp functions worth mentioning. The first is lerp unclamped, which allows the t value to go beyond the typical range of zero to one. This means you can continue interpolating outside the limits. For example, if you are interpolating from 0 to 100 and set t to 1.5, the function will return 150. Similarly, if you set t to minus 0.5, it will return minus 50. This is useful when you need to extrapolate values beyond the given range. The second function is inverse lerp. Here you provide the limits and the current value, and inverse lerp returns a t-value between 0 and 1. For instance, here the function returns 0.5, indicating that 50 is halfway between 0 and 100. Next, let's discuss the repeat function. This function takes t as the first parameter and length as the second parameter. It loops the value of t between 0 and the specified length. For example, if t is 7 and the length is 5, repeat will return 2. In other words, it acts like the modulo operator but works with decimals. One use case for this function is creating looping animations by passing time.time .time as the first parameter and the target length as the second. Lastly, we have the ping pong function, 
It works similarly to the repeat function, but with a key difference. Instead of only moving forward and resetting to zero after reaching the target length, ping pong goes backward towards zero after reaching the length. For example, if t is seven and the length is five, the repeat function would return two. However, ping pong first reaches five, then goes back two units to three, so the result would be three. This function is mainly used for creating back and forth animations by passing time dot time as the first parameter and the end target as the second. With ping pong, the value oscillates between zero and the target length, creating a continuous back and forth motion. Next, let's cover numerical functions, which are used to perform various operations on numbers. These include functions like min and max, which require two arguments and return the minimum and maximum number between them. We use these in our character controller script to check if the player is receiving input in either direction or moving forward. Another useful function we used in this script is mathf.abs, which returns the absolute value of a number, effectively removing the sign and giving you the positive value, which helps to check if the player is providing input. It doesn't matter if it's forward or backward. In contrast, the mathf.sign function tells you the sign of a number, indicating whether it's positive or negative. This can be used to determine the direction of a value. For instance, in our car controller tutorial, we used mathf.sign to check if the car is moving forward or backward. Now, what if you want to compare two numbers to check if they're equal or not? You would simply use the equality operator to compare them. However, there's a potential issue with this approach. Let's say you want to check if a value is equal to 1. When the value is exactly 1, the code will execute as expected. But if the value is very close to 1 and might be acceptable for your use case, but the equality operator won't return true because it's not exactly 1. In these situations, you can use the mathf.approximately function. This function returns true if the value is approximately equal. This is particularly useful in physics calculations where precision might vary slightly. In such cases, you can also use the seal function, which rounds a number up to the next integer. Note that the result will be a float. If you need an integer, you can use the seal to int function, which returns the same result but as an integer. If your scenario is the opposite, where your value is decreasing and you're comparing it to a lower number, you can use the floor function. This function rounds the number down to the next lower integer. Similar to the seal function, if you need the result as an integer, you can use the floor to int function. Next, let's talk about the round function, which combines aspects of both the seal and floor functions. The round function rounds a value to the nearest integer. Unlike the floor and seal functions, which round directly down or up, round first checks which integer is closer. For example, if the number is 1.4, it will be rounded to 1, and if the number is 1.7, it will be rounded to 2. Similar to the previous functions, there is also a version that returns an integer called round to int. Next up, let's discuss functions related to powers. First, we have the pow function, which returns the first number raised to the power of the second number. For example, this will return the value of 2 raised to power 10. And if you want to go the opposite way, where you already have a number and you want to find what power it is of another number, you can use the log function. For example, if you want to find what power of 2 equals 1024, you can use math f.log and it will tell you that it's the 10th power of 2. For base 10, there's a straightforward function called log 10 which requires only one argument that is the number and returns the power of 10 that equals that number. Additionally, you can find the square root of any number using the square root function. Then there is exponential function, which returns e raised to the power of the provided number. This is useful in situations where you need to increase or decrease a value exponentially, meaning the rate of growth or decay becomes faster and faster over time. However, you might not want the number to keep increasing or decreasing indefinitely. To set limits, you can use the clamp function, which restricts the value within specified limits. If you need to clamp a number between 0 and 1, you can use the clamp 0, 1 function directly. Now let's explore the trigonometric functions. Imagine you have a right-angled triangle formed by vectors. If you know an angle and the length of one side, 
you can easily find the lengths of the other sides using the appropriate trigonometric formulas. For instance, if you have a vector, like a ray you're casting at a certain angle to a plane, you can determine the x or y component of the vector using the cosine or sine of that angle. Another practical application is making an object oscillate. Since the values of sine and cosine oscillate between minus 1 and 1, you can use these functions to create oscillating motion by applying them within a lerp function. Now what if you have the lengths of the sides and want to find the angle between them? Then you can use inverse trigonometric functions. These are the opposites of the standard trigonometric functions. By inputting the lengths of the sides, you can calculate the angle in radians. However, there's an issue with using these functions. Trigonometric functions can give the same value for different angles. For instance, in the example above where we get 45 degrees, the actual angle could be 225 degrees because both give the same value for the tangent of the angle. In such cases, you should use the atan2 function. It returns the angle in radians with the correct quadrant. While using trigonometric functions, you might encounter the problem of angle units. All the inverse functions return angles in radians, and all the standard functions require angles in radians. To solve this problem, you can use the degree to radian before passing any angle as an argument. Similarly, when you get a resulting angle, you can convert it from radians to degrees. Additionally, while performing calculations, you might need the value of pi. You can use the math f dot pi constant, which returns the value of pi in radians. Another useful function for angle calculations is delta angle. This function returns the shortest angle between two given angles, which can be very helpful in various scenarios involving angular measurements. And that's it for this video. I hope you found something helpful. If you have any questions or need further clarification, join our Discord server. Thanks for watching.